Well, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with you for uh, for this summertime conference. <laughs> uh, and I'll have to admit, when I when I got the call, I guess sometime in the winter, or last fall, from from Pastor Peterson, I, I wondered what was up. I didn't know, you know, it was a little early for April Fools, but uh, you know, I, I had no idea of what what my topic was going to be, or or really what necessarily I had to offer. And uh, he was trying to be helpful and faithful and, and say, well, what, what are you writing about for your, for your doctorate? And I told him with great enthusiasm what I was working on for my doctorate. He said, well, that's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you need to choose something else. So uh, you know, that, that really got me thinking. We talked for a while on the phone. And, you know, as Lutherans, we are really, really good with our doctrine of, of justification. We're really good with our solace, as we should be. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, of course, found in the Scriptures alone. Our preaching and teaching all hang from this truth, as it should. But when it comes to sanctification, maybe we're not the best. Because when we start talking about sanctification, or we start talking about the work of the Spirit, you know, sometimes we can kind of uh, maybe slip into charismaticism or worry that we're going to slip into charismaticism. So we just leave that uh, off to the side. So there's confusion there. Although, you know, we will confess that justification and sanctification are not to be separated, that they go hand in hand. But when it comes to the definition of it, mm, we kind of move away or start sounding like the Methodists. Or the Baptists. Uh, we were emailed a, an article, I guess, or a, a blog recently that had some of that kind of talk. You know, oh, we know the Spirit works through the Word, but that's the normal stuff. Let's talk about these Spirit sightings. And uh, it sounds kind of strange, and it is kind of strange, especially to come uh, from Lutherans. Now, uh, many of you... Uh, probably most of you don't know my background, uh, and I'll admit again that I'm here as the token St. Louis guy. I guess I'm kind of Elijah in the cave amongst all of you uh, Fort Wayne people, uh, but thankfully we've got Ben and, and Pastor Whedon to help things along. But to my background, uh, my background is kind of becoming more of a familiar story within the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, than it has been even in the decades past. Um, I was baptized as an infant in the Lutheran Church, but actually grew up in the Baptist Church. And I'm actually wondering how many born and bred German Lutherans we actually have sitting in the pews today. I know down in the South, we, we don't have a lot. There's a lot of people uh, like me. Do we have any born and bred German Lutherans still here? Probably more here than, than, uh, than anywhere, but still maybe not, uh, not so many. So the number of converts among us is increasing, uh, but that's me, Baptist kid. All of the scriptures I learned, I learned as a Baptist, and I was really, really good with the Bible, really, really good with the stories, not so much the unity of the scriptures, but if you told me book, chapter, and verse, I could find it. Not, of course, because I was a Bible scholar, but because they would give us Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco baseball cards for doing our Bible drills the right way. But again, none of the scriptures had any unity uh, to them, especially with the Old Testament. The Old Testament didn't matter anymore because in my growing up, in my background, since Jesus had come, the Old Testament was gone. It's old for a reason, right? But using that method of interpretation has lasting effects on the life of a Christian. Now, that doesn't mean that the church I grew up in as a child didn't confess that God created the world and everything in it in six days. Of course, they confessed that. They held uh, to those uh, biblical standards. Of course, Adam and Eve were real people. But for man's original purpose within the creation, that is to take care of it, that had to change. 
because that was old. And now that Jesus has come, the reason for being is different. Now that Jesus has come to save you, you need to now live a life of appreciation to him and show him how appreciative you are that he has come to save you. Thus, the works that flow from faith aren't done simply because your neighbor needs them. They're done to prove your dedication to God. So Jesus has brought you in by his cross, and now it's your job to stay in. And that, to that tradition, is what sanctification is. So now here's where things got confusing for me growing up. In our return to the Lutheran church when I was about 13, it was justification that made sense to me for the first time ever. Right? I heard the gospel without works attached for the first time, but it was sanctification that was still taught in the same way. And I am going to use the board because I remember one of my very first catechism classes Apparently, in the church at the time, they were supposed to get the first, at least through the second article of the creed and first year catechism, and third article was supposed to start second year. And, and one of the very first classes, I remember, like it was yesterday, the drawing on the board. Some of you might have seen it, right? It's the stair step that Jesus has saved you, and his saving you has put you on the staircase, and your life is meant to climb the stairs. And this worked out really, really well for me as a, as a Baptist comfort kid, because this is what we in our old youth groups, that, you know, by, by doing good for your neighbor, you know, maybe by sharing Jesus with the kid in school that sits by himself at lunch or something like this, or going on the summer youth retreat where you could get fired up for Jesus and get that extra shot of the Spirit, that would help you kind of ascend the stairs. And you would get here, maybe on the youth retreat, all fired up, and there you would be told, uh, now you just need to do more, do more, do more. And I remember one year, very specifically, uh, we had a, a group of high schoolers that came home and they had been encouraged. They had been uh, challenged was the word. They had been challenged to go home and sell their possessions because that's in the Bible, right? So they went home and they sold their cars. And they said, we don't need cars. We can walk and ride our bicycles everywhere. Now, this, was, this is Coleman, Alabama. You know, yeah, you, you can ride your bicycles everywhere, but, but still they're kind of missing the point. But they were essentially told that if they would do this, they would be here now in their life of sanctification while, you know, I'm still stuck down here. Sanctification was my work. However, again, in the Lutheran church, I was given this same image. So I was kind of excited. I could still kind of jive with the Baptist, could still go to youth group with my friends and could get along uh, theologically. The difference was in the Lutheran church, there was always the disclaimer. You're on this stair step, but remember, these works don't save you, but you still have the responsibility to climb the ladder. So at this point, 13, 14 years old, the only noticeable difference for me in the Lutheran church was that the gospel, or we had uh, justification and the sacrament of the altar, worship was a little more reverent. Everything else was basically the same. Maybe this is just part of being Lutheran in the South and you don't hear a lot of this in the Midwest, this confusion over sanctification. But this is not the way the scriptures present sanctification at all. And if we're to uh, be confessors of the faith and to especially meet the challenges 
that we're being faced with in our world today, I believe that we need to reclaim this doctrine of sanctification and to see how it actually, truly plays out in our lives. So first of all, what does the word actually mean to sanctify? Well, it means to be made holy. Well, that's all well and good, but that's a loaded term, right? To be to be made holy or to be set apart. And now we're getting somewhere. So in order to make the point, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the old because it does matter. And from the beginning, we will see that all the way through the scriptures, God is constantly sanctifying, constantly making holy and setting things apart and that the work doesn't lie with man at all. It is truly passive outside of us. The Apostle Paul confesses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So from the beginning, consider creation itself. Of all the billions of stars, galaxies, planets, and everything else that's created out there. It is this place, earth, that God set apart for life. And he created the animals, all the way from the creepy crawlies to the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens. But then from all the things that he created, he set apart another creature from the rest of everything that had come before, the highlight of his creation made in his, and he called him man. And then within this earth that he appointed for life, he created a place for that man, a place where God would walk in the cool of the day with this man, this garden called Eden. So in that garden, he took the set apart man and placed him in this set apart garden. That set apart garden, he set apart one specific tree and appointed that tree for life. Of course, you know how this goes. God's set apart people typically don't go for what's set apart for good and instead turn to what they want. And we'll see some more of that later. And as a result of that first sin, corruption increased upon the earth, so God came to destroy it. And how did the corruption come about? What are we told in the scriptures? We're told that the sons of God, the sons of the promise, rejected their set-apartness by God. They instead went into the daughters of men, the daughters of Cain, and conceived children by them. We'll see this play out more later as well. But notice that God doesn't destroy everything in his creation. He sets apart Noah and his wife and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, making them holy, setting them apart, sanctifying them, and through them bringing about a new creation. Now, if you were like me, even growing up, learning to read, you get to this point in the Bible, and then you start skipping stuff. Because right after the flood, you're met with uh, the second already genealogy. Just a bunch of hard names and long years. What does any of it mean? Why is it there? Well, it's there to show us God continuing to set his people apart. Shem set apart from Ham and eventually Japheth. Then he calls Abram, a descendant from the set apart Shem. He calls him out of Ur, where the worship of the moon god Sin 
was prevalent. God calls Abram out of this life of idolatry, and he brings him into a new land, a land set apart from all the other land in creation, and promises Abram that land. The sanctification, the setting apart continues after that. We see Isaac set apart from Ishmael, Jacob set apart from Esau. And there is actually a distinction there to look into. This is not just arbit an arbitrary passing along of the promise or favoritism being shown. We actually see in the scriptures that Esau goes the way of the world. Listen to the scriptures. When Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Be'eri the Hittite, to be his wife, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah, written in Genesis 26. Jacob, on the other hand, is intentionally set apart by his mother to go the way of the promise. Genesis 28. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So when Esau saw that Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went into Ishmael and took as his wife Besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Even if anyone wants to accuse Rebekah and Jacob of foul play, Esau does continue the way of the world, and Jacob goes the way of the set apart. And then beginning with Jacob, things grow from two sons from whom to choose, to 12, 12 sons by four women. Leah, of course, was first. You get Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah. Rachel can't conceive. But Rachel has a maidservant. This is where things get fun, right? It says, Bilhah, go into my husband and have me children so that I can raise them. And then here come Dan and Naphtali. And of course, the sister thing gets going. And Leah says, oh yeah, well, not only can I have children for, uh, for my husband, I've got a maidservant too. Zilpah, go into Jacob. And then an Asher. I mean, the point where Leah actually has to buy her husband back and then has Issachar and Zebulun. Rachel then finally conceives and has Joseph and Benjamin. But it was Judah from the 12 who was set apart. We're told in Genesis 49, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Abraham and Sarah had first been promised it. Kings shall come from now of Abraham, Judah was set apart from the rest to carry on the promise. And again, we'll see that the brothers, Judah's brothers, all go eventually the way of the world. Then in the scriptures, we see God's people enslaved in a place not their own for 400 years. But notice the language that God uses as his set-apart Savior Moses approaches Pharaoh during the plagues. Exodus 8. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me or else if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put a division between my people and your people. And in every plague from that point forward, Israel is set apart from Egypt. Darkness in Egypt. Light in Goshen. And then the tenth plague, we see this set apartness even more. This tenth plague, there's deep preparation involved. God was making sure that there would be no consideration that any of this was a coincidence that these things were happening to Egypt and not to Israel. It would be by the blood of the lamb put on the doorposts and the lintel that God would see that blood and pass over his people. God is very clear with his instructions. This meal was to be a set-apart meal for his set-apart people, written in Exodus chapter 12. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside of the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover of the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. And finally, God did very visually, just like he had done with the plagues, setting apart his people one final time from Egypt. It was as the Red Sea was set apart one side from the other that God's people walked through on dry ground, making it safely to the other side while the Egyptians drowned in the rushing waters. Just like the world in the days of Noah before them, so it happened again. There in the wilderness that we see this tension highlighted even more and growing throughout the Old Testament. God had set his people apart by the blood of of the Passover lamb and through the waters of the Red Sea. He had fulfilled his promise to them. All the way down to the last letter to Abraham, he had told Abraham back in Genesis 15 that they would be in a land not their own for 400 years. But God's word came to pass. Now, while I don't want to let Israel completely off the hook for their grumbling, I do want to show you one of the things that I call the deep tracks of the scriptures. These are the things that we either forget or that we don't remember because we start telling these familiar stories from memory and hardly ever go back to the actual text of Exodus 12, 13, and 14. And again, I'm not looking to excuse Israel here, but the scriptures might actually be hinting to us the source of the grumblings with which they grumbled. After the death of the firstborn in 12, we see God's people go forth in haste. And then we're told in verse 38 that a mixed multitude also went up with them and very much uh, livestock, both flocks and herds. You can see how this would have played out in Egypt, right? Egypt had become a world power uh, in the days of Joseph, delivering them through the famine. Egypt was the cultural center of the Mediterranean world. Travelers from all over the place 
would be there. Can you imagine, say, having been uh, from a different part of the Mediterranean world visiting Egypt in the time of the plagues? Here you have this world-dominating power. Here you have God on earth in Pharaoh, and he's being swarmed with frogs and flies, and he can't do anything about it. All Pharaoh can do in this situation is to continue in his rebellion. And then all of a sudden, he lets hundreds of thousands, millions with women and children, slaves just walk out into the wilderness. What would you do as a traveler to Egypt? I want to go with them and their God. Thus, Israel and a mixed multitude went out into the wilderness. But when they were out in the wilderness, even before they crossed the Red Sea, the grumblings begin. You can see this play out too, right? Israelite number one, I'm hungry. Israelite number two, oh, I'm hungry too. Mixed multitude, oh, don't you remember those meat pots? Israelites, meat pots? What are you talking about? Oh, yeah, the meat pots, and then they get going. It doesn't take much. Grumble, grumble. So it would be very easy to see how Israel could have been spurred along by this mixed multitude who only knew Yahweh by the plagues of Egypt and nothing of the 400 years of slavery. It would make no sense to them at all to see God's people hungry or thirsty, or to be in the wilderness at all, for that matter. I mean, why should they have to wait at the foot of the mountain while some old guy went to the top and seemingly disappeared for 40 days and 40 nights? Where's his brother? Aaron, up! Make for us the true God who brought us out of Egypt, this golden calf. I mean, you never know. Could have been 400 years before they had heard from God again. So they follow. God's people would rebel against their set apart status from then on, even as they entered into this land promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. They were told, they were commanded to eliminate all the inhabitants of the land. These are sons of Ham. By the way, the genealogies are important, sons of the curse. This was not to be the land of the curse. Instead, it was the land of the promise, set apart for the set apart. But God's people intermingled and intermarried with them instead. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. Written in Judges chapter 1, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beit Shean and its villages, or Ta'anak and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in the land. When Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. I speak Southern Hebrew, by the way. But this carried on throughout all the tribes. Not one tribe completed the conquest as God had commanded. Not one brother remained entirely set apart. And you would think if anybody should know the result of putting people to forced labor, it would have been Israel. But no, the ways of the world were too tempting. And Dan perhaps is the worst offender of all. Written in Joshua 19, Dan was supposed to inherit, I'm going to draw again. Dan was supposed to inherit 
the land of the Philistines. They get the beach. Who doesn't want the beach? But the Philistines were a little too intimidating for them, so they completely rejected their inheritance and went all the way north. That's why you have Dan, the city, in the north, and Dan, the tribe, in the south. This city, this area, by the way, would become a great center of idolatry in the New Testament, uh, known as Caesarea Philippi. Great idolatry there. But Dan doesn't want his set-apart place. He rebels against it, going someplace completely different. Of course, uh, this intermingling, this rejection, doesn't go without consequence. Much like the devil did in the garden and the mixed multitude in the wilderness, the surrounding nations all around make the things of the world look tempting. And then the cries rang out, give us a king. Why? That we might be like them. Give us a king that we might be like all the nations. And God says, well, they want it. They got it. If they want to reject me as king, if they want to reject their set apart that I did for them, let them have it. And notice who they choose. They go after a king like the world wants. They go after a king like the world desires. Saul, tall, told to us in the scriptures as head and shoulders above the rest, handsome and strong. Why do they want him though? Not only to be like all the nations, they want him specifically to be there to lead them into battle. Give us the biggest. Give us the strongest. No one wants to be led into battle by a box. Samuel, faithful Samuel, actually argued the point, though. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He contended over this with God. And when what he, he knew was going to happen actually happened, he, of course, lets God have it. I told you this was going to happen. Why did you let them do this? Saul, even though head and shoulders above the rest, the strongest, he proved to be unfaithful and paranoid and a coward. But where is God in all this? Continuing to set apart and choosing David. Not David the firstborn. David, much like uh, the ones who had come before him. The youngest, maybe the least. Yet after David, things fall apart again. Even Solomon, the wisest of the wise, departed from the word, which was his source of wisdom. Why? To be like the nation. Kingdom expansion. And what did he do? The son of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and married any as he chose. He built altars to their gods, sacrificing to them. The kingdom splits. What was once the unified people of God in a set-apart Land promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob were now set apart from one another. North from south. And it's always the north's fault. <laughs> Just in case you needed to know. As a result, uh, Babylon comes knocking at the door because Judah, faithful Judah, 
even went the way of the north as well. Jeroboam's golden calves, the prosperity that the world could offer was, was just too much. But when Babylon comes, what had been completely set apart was no longer. No temple, no land, no real identity anymore. That is except Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even in a foreign land, my map doesn't go this far, but even in a foreign land, they continued to see themselves as the sanctified of God. And not because of what they had done, but because who God had made them. For Daniel, for Shadrach, for Meshach, and for Abednego, there was no bowing the knee to Nebuchadnezzar's golden image, furnace, or lion's den. There was no fear. And even in those stories, these are these minor details that we need not forget. They're so important when we're talking about God's people being set apart. Notice in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what happens to them? The furnace is heated, what, seven times hotter than it ever is? They are bound and thrown into the furnace. And what is their end? Up, unbound, walking around with a fourth, one like a son of the gods, it is said. But even the men who bound them and threw them into the furnace, they could not withstand the heat, you see. God's sanctified, God's set apart, unbound walking, the ones of the world perish in the flames. Now, upon the return to the land in the days of Cyrus the Persian, that's when things can get a little more interesting the likes of Ezra and Nehemiah were driving the reconstruction of the temple and the city walls, respectively. But what they saw out of the people was troubling. Again, you'd think that God's people would learn after a while. I don't know why we would. We don't. But as soon as they get back, those pesky Samaritans, right? The Samaritans, the ones who... Uh, of the north who had intermarried with the Assyrians and the other people put into the land during the Assyrian exile. Go up. Hey, what you got going on here? Can we help? And the answer should have been, no, go away. But God's people don't learn. As had happened already before, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they married, took as wives any as they chose, even against Ezra and Nehemiah's warnings, written in Ezra chapter 9. After these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not done what? They have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands and their abominations from the the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites, people who shouldn't have been around in the first place had God's people been faithful after the days of Joshua. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faith, uh, faithlessness, the hand of the officials of the chief men has been foremost. Now, it's interesting. If you have a look at the book of Ezra and get all the way to the end, Ezra actually documents all those guilty. Imagine having been guilty and your name's forever written in the scriptures for having been guilty. These people didn't learn. Nehemiah doesn't pull any punches either, literally. Literally. In addition to intermarriage, he also confronted them about not keeping the Sabbath day holy set apart, which we'll get into later. This is another good section. I bring this up when we talk about uh, 
about church discipline and tell people that, uh, that it could be worse, right? Written in Nehemiah, as soon as it began to grow dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors be shut and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them, and I said to them, why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do it again, I'm going to lay hands on you. It's a good pastoral approach. It's what we learn at St. Louis, by the way. <laughs> From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O oh my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married the women of Ashdod, we're talking Philistines here, Ammon and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod. They're little, they're little Philistines. They could not speak the language of Judah. We'll talk about this later. This is very important. But only the language of each people. And I confronted them. This is excellent. Have you all read Nehemiah lately? This is, this is fantastic. So Nehemiah, faithful Nehemiah, I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. And I made, don't do this, by the way. I mean, you can. I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, you shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Remember where we have been, right? We've just gotten back from exile. Among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women made even him to sin. Shall we listen to you and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women? See, being and remaining set apart was a big deal to Ezra, to Nehemiah, to Daniel, to Shadrach, to Meshach, and Abednego, and some of the faithful who came before them. And then scripturally speaking, things kind of go dark for us. We enter into this intertestamental period, this 400 years between the Old and the New Testaments. And it was very important that God's people would try to navigate being set apart in this new world, set apart under the rule of foreign nations. So the question becomes, how? How are we to remain faithfully the people of God, the set apart, the sanctified, the holy, under foreign rule. How are they to do this? The line of David is intact. They're looking at David's son who should be on the throne, but he's not. That was for Xerxes or Alexander, the Antiochids, the Seleucids, the Ptolemies, the Hasmoneans, and the Caesars. God's people were made to live under laws that were contrary to God's law. The law that was given in the first place, by the way, as a setting apart. Leviticus 19, you shall be holy, set apart, sanctified, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Well, they might not have had a king, and they didn't have a rightful high priest either because that office was being bought and sold to the highest bidder. 
and the highest bidder often got his money from the temple treasury. Just rob it and give it to, give it to the, the king. And there was no prophet either. No voice from God to say anything about it. How are they to be faithful? How are they to remain faithful? That's where these strange groups pop up in the New Testament. And all of a sudden we hear about groups that we've never heard about before in the Old Testament. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. These are groups that come about during this period of history based on this question of faithfulness, of how to live as God's set-apart people. Each of these groups had their own idea. They were drastically different, especially these Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pharisees could worship, say, in the synagogue. A Sadducee wouldn't do that. They're temple only. The Pharisees were reading from the, the prophets. Well, the Sadducees would never do that either. That's why these Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection, when they question Jesus about the resurrection, Jesus quotes to them from the books of Moses. He doesn't quote from them uh, from the prophets. They don't, they don't hold those as, as valid. Um, I mean, they couldn't even agree on what day it was. Sadducees followed a solar calendar and the Pharisees followed a lunar calendar. Imagine. Then you have other groups, zealots, the Essenes. The Essenes just decided, well, we're just going to go away from it all. We'll, of course, talk about the Essenes maybe later and our response to all of this today. But they go off into the wilderness and just think they're, you know, the, the, the days are, are over with. But this tension that is highlighted with the Pharisees and the Sadducees are going to kind of get us into tomorrow. We'll maybe take a look back at some of these texts and see that, you know, God doesn't just set his heart for the sake of setting them apart and saying, look at my people over here. There's always a reason behind it. Of course, with God, there is what God is doing in the midst of all of this chaos. You know, in a way, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they do have the right mind in desiring faithfulness. They're just very, very wrong in how it came about. Kind of like a confused Lutheran boy trying to show back up in the Baptist church, trying to intermingle both traditions together. But if we are to be faithful, if we are who God has called us to be through baptism as his holy, his sanctified, his set apart, and meet the challenges that are facing the church today and to do it faithfully, we must first see that sanctification is the work of God and that it's the way he's always done things. This, along with looking back at our history, will be crucial to the faithful confession of our faith uh, to our children and to our children's children. I think I'll leave part one there, if that's all right with you. Maybe some questions. Uh, one thing I thought that was interesting, uh, this, this has been a really wonderful presentation you kind of tie the beginnings, it would seem, of Israel's decline as a nation, the drawing out of the mixed multitude, right? Um, so do you regard it as a negative thing that that mixed multitude was, that, that some Egyptians were, were brought along with the people of Israel in the midst of their wilderness wandering, or is it a grace of God that calls these people to become part of uh, God's salvation through the promise, and, but on the other hand still has negative results because of the inevitable nature of the fall and the sinful nature that abides in all of us. It's, it's a great question. Uh, when I read the text from the Passover, you know, God is very clear that it's not, it's not bad to have the foreigners or the with you. But if they are to come along, you're to 
circumcise them, right? Bring them, bring them along in the tradition. Um, this mixed multitude, this kind of interests me because we're not really told much about them, whether they just kind of, you know, in, in my mind, they just kind of jump on board with this God of Israel and take off and take off in wilderness. Now, this is also not to say that just because God's people are God's people, they're just kind of, they never do anything wrong either, right? Um, Can I ask you a, please? A follow-up question in that regard. Um, in the midst of it, and you'll forgive me, I have my biblical knowledge of uh, I think it's the plague of hail in which God declares that the hail is coming. And there's a reference that not only all of the people of Israel who heed the Lord's command, but the people of Egypt as well who heed or spare. I wonder if that might be, if that might relate at all to the mixed. It, 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 I realize this is kind of venturing into pious speculative territory, right? right? But th there is this reference to a group that heeds the Lord's command and therefore receives the blessing of the Spirit from his wrath. And then this reference to a mixed multitude. Any sure. thought on the relationship between those two? I have lots of thoughts. I just don't know that I should share them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I mean, if we, are, if we are to go back and pick up, and, and again, with the foreigners, the sojourners, uh, slaves, you know, having been circumcised, you know, it is, it is necessary. And I'm just thinking of, of with all of this in the end, that we are also confessors that, you know, God's plan of salvation has also, you know, been for Gentiles all along. So, um, I guess my point with, with this and, what I, and, and how I, I would like us to, to think through the next couple of days is that as people are brought along, that they're not speaking the language of the, Ash, of the Philistines like the kids were, right? That we have... That we have a language, we have a culture, and it's not this. It's, you know, it's the set-apart stuff. The balance that I struggle with, with this and talking about this, especially publicly, is I think there's a fine line where you can start to be very pharisaical. If we're going to put ourselves back on the stairs, almost like I'm up here and little old you's down here, like we're set, you know, we're set apart. We're set apart more, kind of. And we don't, you know, we don't necessarily need to be there either. I, I think there's a... I think there's a real risk, actually, of a kind of false humility that is ashamed of pure doctrine and is ashamed of the fact, I mean, so there is a sort of something like, all oh, shucks, guys, we're all sinners, we're all trying our best, right? And I think that's actually, that's part of the problem with the mixed multitude, is that we're becoming corrupted by this in, in, in many ways, and, and we don't just want to say, look, uh, you know, you got to get circumcised. Right. You know, there's a cost to this, and, and you don't get to choose which parts of this apply and which parts don't. There, there's a humility that's required to submit, right, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? And apart from the fear of the Lord, it's not real wisdom, or apart from the sort of sacrifice of being circumcised and submitting to the dietary regulations and all of, right? You know, you're good. So... I, I hear what you're saying, but I think actually this is kind of a particular uh, temptation of those who live in a syncretistic, pluralistic society that, you know, we don't want to come off pharisaical, but uh, maybe we need to be afraid of coming off as uh, compromisers right. who are just simply cultural, you know. No, the whole, the whole thing is to actually recognize that we are different. Yeah. We are not going to mix ourselves 
we're not going to mix ourselves with the world. Uh, I don't know how many of you watched videos online during COVID, but it's shocking how mixed a lot of practices are in with, with the world. Um, what, what we allow uh, our young people to be involved in and tolerate or simply to, and, and I will get into some of this later, where, you know, we may send our young people out and say, oh, they're catechized too well. You know, we've, we've taught them the truth. We do the truth the right way here. They won't fall for any of this stuff. It's like, yeah, they will. They're going to, I mean, look, script, Scripture, when, when Jeroboam builds those golden calves and puts one up here in Dan and one down here in Bethel, I mean, just close enough to Jerusalem. It's like, and he says, you don't have to go that far anymore. You've gone, you've gone to Jerusalem far enough. It's like, you only have a couple more miles to go. But he puts it right here. And after, after these golden calves are made, it is word for word, the same thing in the, in the wilderness at Mount Sinai. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Word for word. And nobody says, I think we've been there before. Nobody. And there's not, you look at all the list of kings in the, in the northern kingdom, there's not one righteous. Not a single one. And uh, so to, to, have, to, to have this maybe uh, arrogance about us, like we're not going to, oh, we won't be like them. Yeah, we, yeah, we will. And we are in a lot, in a lot, in a lot more than you, than you think. Uh, you know, I think some of this too is, is difficult because if we were able to simply have conversations about this and to you make a point and I make a point, it would be a lot different. But, you know, the way things are today, you get something out there. You're like, can you believe him? He, it's, it's, we can't even have a about it. You know, this is my confession. This is what I'm saying. You make your confession and let's but I mean, how much, how different is that than the way that Daniel was perceived? I mean, you know, this is, I think there's, a, this is the kind of humility that I think it, precisely we're lacking is that we're so afraid of the opinions of our neighbors that we soft sell and we try to pretend like, oh no, we're not Ned Flanders. We're not these sorts of care. And, and uh, you know, it, it actually ends up, well, first of all, it doesn't work. I mean, if that mattered, but it's also just, it's not arrogant to say, this is what the Bible says. There's only one God. There's only one way to heaven. You know, and I, I think, I, I, I mean, I'm hearing you talk about this mixed thing. And all I can think is, we have to have Lutheran schools. Yeah. Right? We can't, let, we can't let our you're sons. Getting, you're getting into Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't. Don't spoil Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. I'm showing editor favoritism. I'm sorry, <laughs> well, we're, we're loud. I'm, 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 I'm so this is probably just a mini asking for some freedom. Yeah, after But I'm, I'm wondering, we're going to have to be able to respond when we look at the Old Testament ideas of being separate and now getting into what we're going to say holiness means for us. It's, it's kind of a little different. Like, how are we going to respond to people who favor, like, the Benedict Option or the monasteries or the Mennonites or people like that? What, why would, what would we say to them when they say, well, that's exactly what we're doing? Right. And I'll, I'll get into this later, but Paul say, you know, I'm not saying about the godly people of the world or else you'd have to go out of the world. And, and we're not necessarily called to do that, right? We have the commission to go and make disciples of all nations. If we're just kind of withdrawn on somebody's farm, we've accomplished the mission. And it's, it's, uh, it's unfaithfulness. I'm not, I don't know how much of this I will get into in, in the third part. I, when, I, when I've talked about this to people before, I've often kind of used uh, the image of, of war or of a battle. 
You know, sometimes um, pickets charge, for example. Sometimes it's not worth it anymore to just keep sending guys through the field. You know, sometimes, uh, I mean, Gettysburg's a little different, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes you, you need to, you do actually need to withdraw the troops to, to gather everybody together to get the game plan once again, to remind people of the task and mission, and then re-engage. The Apostle Paul's first missionary journey, he made it all the way up through, and what was it? He had made it in around Galatia, Iconium, and places like this, that he had gained some unfortunate followers, that band of uh, the Jews who started following him, and when they finally cornered him, where was it, Derby? Someplace through there, they, they stoned him and dragged him out of the city. Now, I'm thinking if, if following the Benedict option, he's up, up here in Galatia. If he's following the Benedict option, he's hightailing it back to Antioch and staying there. But what does Paul do? How many pastors are here? Where does, where does Paul go next? He goes right back through the cities where the guys, where they sent men who stoned him. And he went, and he went for a reason. The scriptures tell us, the, the Acts of the Apostles tells us that he went as an encouragement to the brothers. Like, look at what they're going to do to you. Go anyway. Right? And the first place, second missionary journey, third missionary journey, he doesn't go this way anymore. He says, I'm going here first to encourage the brothers some more. So I don't necessarily think that withdrawal is faithful, complete withdrawal, maybe to, maybe to reorganize the, the troops, so to speak. But um, well, we've got to do something. You've got to be something Christological about the shift. Because safe, uh, holiness or set apartness shifts somehow when you get to Christ, when you get to Paul in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. There's been a shift in understanding of exactly what that's about. Well, it's not, I mean, it's no longer this land, this temple, right? So it, there, there is this kind of going out about it, and uh, and that's maybe at some point we can be the, the standard bearers for the church. I don't remember what what book I was reading. I'll remember it later, but there was a there was just a small comment about. left-hand kingdom stuff. I don't remember what it was. Very small section on the LCMS said, the LCMS has this right. They just can't get out of their way enough to get it to the world, right? Like we just, I'm not saying we shouldn't, you know. We need to. Go ahead. Yeah, when you were talking about the uh, the, the mission for the, to the Gentiles, even in, even even in the Old Testament, it's so easy for us to overlook it because when Gentile when Gentiles come in come into Israel, they stop being Gentiles. Yeah. Right. When they're they're no longer considered Gentiles anymore. Like after like after David conquers Jerusalem and all and, and all all the all the natives there are are grafted into Israel. All the, all the, 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 you know, the, the women in the history of, of, of uh, the, the genealogy of Jesus, they are, they're, they're Gentiles who are grafted into Israel. Right. They stop being Gentiles. There's, there's the problem. The ones who, the ones who still speak the foreign languages, they never became part of Israel. They always kept their apartness distinct, even in their own families, so that the families were never united. No, you're Right, and this is the this early church issue with the Apostle Paul is, you know, the Gentiles come in, you got the Jewish 
Christians up here saying, well, you're not enough because you haven't been circumcised. You need to come under the first before you're the, you're the second. No understanding that what, what Paul is saying in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, but there is this, you, you learn the language and the rituals of the um, community. Or maybe you'll get this later. Sure. Different. We yeah. should be able to get so that. We actually don't do those things. Yeah. Right. How do we communicate that to yeah. a couple of generations of people who see no distinction between where they live, like America, and Christianity? So, in other words, they want to go back to a time that they grew up in where America was Christian in their mind. And good disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I no, think I probably more so than it is today. Oh, well, <laughs> admittedly. So how is that communicated when they do not see that there needs to be a real distinction between who we are as a people in a nation? And who we are as Christ's sanctified people. Does that question make sense? Yes. How do we deal with that? Yeah. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking how annoying it is when Jason asks questions. <laughs> this is. Why do I come? <laughs> you, can do, you can do this just as well without me. <laughs> This is, this is a struggle. This is a struggle, is it not? Because it's not, when we talk about or something like this, the person is not from the outside. It's from, you're doing things, what are they teaching at the seminary now? We've never done this before. And, but, so it is kind of a different, it, it is a kind of a different, it is a very different perspective. It's not, I mean, you know, and again, we tend to look at the past through very, very rose-colored glasses. I remember laying out my clothes on Saturday night, you know, everybody's ready, shining your shoes, and, and, and all, all of this kind of thing. But I, I, have to, I have to wonder what is the actual, what is the actual truth. How much, how much were we actually engaging the world around us, were we at all? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's the deal. If, if everybody is Christian, what do you have to what do you have to stand for? Jesus. I mean, everybody sings "Jesus loves me." This I know, very true. But th there was no there was no real opposition and no real threat of of confessing Christ at all. Everybody prayed at school. So I, this is it's kind, of, it's kind of new for us as Americans. Yeah. I, I don't yeah, know how to... Yeah. yeah. Uh, so especially kind of piggybacking on to the, the from within instead of the from without part that you just kind of mentioned. I wonder where all this is going to, uh, and maybe you'll get to this, I don't know. Uh, but when I think of the set apartedness, let's go back to just the mixed multitude, right? Because we can, we can uh, speculate a little bit, right? So let's say, okay, let's say they were actually all circumcised. They were just a mixed multitude by race or, or whatnot. Um, but they still had that back, they hadn't learned the language yet, or they hadn't done, right? But yet they could claim, well, but I am circumcised, so I am the set apart, so now why can't we do it? My way. And, and so there's, I guess there's this question of the growth between, uh, you know, both the, the infant needing the milk and the adult needing the meat are both set apart, but there's a growth from one to the other. That's right. And uh, so I'm, I'm wondering how we, A, how we communicate it, but B, how we stay away from this. Because I think sometimes the problem is we think, well, if you're saying, uh, that you're a newbie, so therefore you don't actually know what you're talking about. Well, maybe you're saying I'm not saved, right? I'm not set apart. 
you know, kind of where I'm right. headed with all that. No, this is uh, <laughs> another interesting thing. I like your milk and, and, and meat to stick around the Passover. I mean, as, as the as the Jews celebrate the Passover, I mean, when they do their there are four questions, and there are different different people who ask the different questions. So there is this. When we talk about lifelong catechesis and all of this, but to, to be to be amongst that group, to remain in humility, to be uh, there. I don't, I don't think there's an easy answer to any of it. Yeah. I mean, whatever whatever we s solve, there's there are going to be more uh, you know more issues. Um, to be fair, I didn't form a very good question. So. No, the question is fine. Uh, yeah, the, the, the question is fine. I, I don't know that I don't know that I have a very good answer for you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Maybe after an IPA. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the best answer is there's no easy answer. Right? Yeah, right. The truth is simple. It's never easy. All right. Hey, thank you. Have well done.